Well, welcome everyone. Happy Monday. I hope you uh, had a great weekend. It's good to see all of you. It's been a while actually since we had a live class. So uh, it's actually kind of nice. I mean, well, not live, live, but live on Zoom anyway. <laughs> live, live, unfortunately. We're going to have to wait a little longer for that, won't we? Um, the test went well. So uh, thank you for your hard work on that. And um, I was really pleased with the results. Uh, I, I thought it was a, a challenging exam in some ways, but many of you uh, really rose to the occasion and, and did very, very well. So uh, keep up the good work. I wanted to show you the grading scale that I use, all right, for uh, all parts of your grade. Um, everybody can see this, right? Um, so, at the, end of, at the end of the course, I'll basically take all the different components of your grade and weigh them together using uh, the weights that are shown in the syllabus, okay? And this is actually the same thing that Canvas is doing right now when it shows you your overall grade, okay? It's weighing the different components by the different weights that are set about at the syllabus, all right? And then you get an overall number, right? And so, any, comp any part of the, of the course, right, um, the grading scale is ex exactly the same out of 100 points uh, for be it the mastering chemistry stuff, be it the um, exams or whatever it is, 93 plus is considered an A. Okay, so the lowest A would be 93. All right, 90 to 92.9 is an A minus. All right, and then 80 to 87, 89 is a B plus, and so on down the road. Okay. Um, I, I see a question about your lowest, and yes, I, I, I will drop um, your, your pre-post lectures. I drop four of those, and then I drop your lowest problem set, okay? And that's at the, I will do, um, I'll make, I'll write myself a note right now to remember to drop, I'll drop two pre-post lectures now, because we're halfway through the course. So I'll drop two of those now after class. I'll go in and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll drop those. And then at the end of the course, I'll drop two more plus a problem set, okay? Um, I do not drop the lowest exam, sorry. Uh, all the exam scores, uh, all the exam scores stay, okay? But then at the, anyway, whatever your point value is, I look at this and, uh, and I assign you a final grade uh, based on this scale. Now, a lot of you might ask, well, what if I'm borderline? What if I'm, you know, 89.9? Well, that's technically a B plus, but in cases like that, I will look at two things. I'll look at your sort of overall effort. Like, what does your effort look like in the class? Um, are you doing your assignments regularly? Um, are you consistent with that, right? So I'll look at that. And then I'll also, the other, the second thing I look at is if you had a bad exam day. So anybody can have a bad exam day. So let's say all your exams are, are Bs, but then you have one D, right? And you end up in a borderline place. I'm gonna say, oh, okay, that, was, that, that exam was kind of an outlier. So they should probably get the higher of the grade uh, on the borderline, okay? So that's how I decide borderline cases, okay? Um, but again, overall, um, I'm, I'm very pleased and, and, and you guys are doing great. So just please keep up the good work. Uh, it's, it's, going, it's going better than I thought it could go on a situation like this. Um, but uh, it seems to me like you're learning the material. So that's great news. Uh, are there any questions? Any questions on anything? Okay, all right. Well, if as we're going, uh, you think of a question, just use the raise hand function and, uh, and I'm happy to answer it. <clears throat> Excuse me, so, so far in this class, you know, we've spent most of our time talking about matter, right? And we've kind of built up uh, from atoms to molecules, right? To chemical reactions and stoichiometry. And uh, we've seen um, a lot of different types of reactions and reactions in solution and redox reactions and combustion reactions and so, but, but we really concentrate on matter. But the other very important component of our universe is energy, okay? I really, our, our universe is composed of really three things, matter, space, and energy, 
right? And um, so, so now we're going to turn our, our attention a little bit to energy, all right? And energy is important in chemistry because a lot of chemical processes involve the transfer of energy, okay? And they'll either give off or they'll absorb energy. Um, the study of chemistry and energy is called thermochemistry, all right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And we'll have, um, we'll talk about thermochemistry this semester, primarily looking at the heat uh, absorbed and emitted by chemical reactions, all right? Uh, and energy exchanges between chemical reactions and uh, their surroundings. And uh, the next semester, we'll come back to energy as a way to learn about what determines the spontaneity of reaction. Remember, I think I talked about this a little bit very early on, but the, the deciding criteria for whether anything happens at all is, does it disperse energy, all right? Is energy dispersed in a process? If energy is dispersed in a process, that process will happen. If energy is not dispersed, it won't happen. Um, that's called the second law of thermodynamics. We're gonna get to that more next semester. This semester, we're really gonna look more just about energy exchanges between a, a chemical system and its surroundings, okay? And that's called thermochemistry. Um, so as an example of some thermochemistry, um, some of you have no doubt uh, used those little uh, packs of um, iron that you sometimes buy to put in your gloves when it's cold and you open them up and uh, a reaction occurs and that reaction releases heat, okay? That, those little packets contain iron powder, all right? And that iron powder reacts with oxygen to form iron three oxide, according to this reaction. And that reaction is exothermic, right? It produces heat. And we briefly introduced exothermic and endothermic very early on in the semester, but let me remind you what, that, what those terms mean. Endothermic means that the reaction or the process absorbs heat. If you have an endothermic process, it's gonna feel cold to the touch. So in, um, if, if you're an athlete and, and you injured yourself, you may have, uh, the, the trainer may have pulled out one of these chemical cold packs that have two separate compartments and when you break the barrier between the two compartments, the two substances uh, mix, and all of a sudden it gets very, very cold, all right? And you can use that to ice an athletic injury, right? Um, or any kind of injury. But it's very, very common uh, in athletics, right? Because they just keep those on the sidelines. If someone gets hurt, bam, they could just pop it open and, and it gets cold. That's an example of an endothermic reaction, a reaction that absorbs heat, okay? Uh, an exothermic reaction, Uh, gives off heat. So the uh, hand warmer that you put in your ski glove, the reaction that occurs there is an example of an exothermic reaction. Okay, it gives off heat. So chemical reactions will often exchange energy with their surroundings, often uh, in the form of heat, but also in other forms as well, which we'll get to uh, a little bit in this chapter. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, let's start uh, with a few definitions, all right? So first of all, let's just define uh, thermochemistry itself. Uh, so thermochemistry uh, is the study of the relationships between chemistry and energy, right? The study of chemistry and energy, all right? Um, energy is the capacity to do work. Energy is the capacity to do work. So for example, uh, a tank of gas contains energy because it has the capacity to do work. What kind of work? driving your car forward or backward or whatever direction, right? So energy is the capacity to do work. Uh, work 
is defined uh, as a force acting on a distance. Force acting on a distance. I can't remember if I have, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> when you push a box across the ground, for example, right, you've done work, right? If I just roll my pen like this, I've done work, right? I've, I've expended energy to exert a force on this pen across a distance, okay? Uh, heat. Heat is the exchange of energy that's caused by a temperature difference. Right, so um, when, you, when you hold a cup of coffee and it cools down, right, it's transferring energy to the surroundings. And so that's an example of heat, all right? Um, <clears throat> kinetic energy. I know I defined, I, might have, I might have defined a few of these really on this semester, but since we're gonna really focus on them, let's make sure we, we all got them. That's uh, energy due to motion. And uh, if you remember from your phys physics class, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, where m is the mass of the object that's moving and v is its velocity, okay? Which, by the way, that's where we get our units for energy, right? Because the units of mass are kilograms, the units of velocity are meters per second, right? And those are squared, so we get one, kilogram meter squared second squared is equal to one joule all right the main unit of energy that we'll use in the mks system okay <coughs> um all right kinetic energy thermal energy is um the energy associated with the temperature of an object Right, so a hot cup of coffee, right, contains thermal energy because it's hot, right? Uh, potential energy. Uh, is the energy associated with the position or composition of an object? So if I lift my pen up from the desk, it has potential energy, right? Due to its position in the Earth's gravitational field. If I let it go, right, it falls because, of, because it's, it's going towards lower potential energy, okay? Sorry, uh, there's a question. Thermal energy, energy associated with the temperature of an object, all right? And then potential energy is the energy associated with the position or composition of an object, right? So if you lift a weight off the ground, it has potential energy because you've lifted it up in the gravitational field, okay? Uh, chemical energy. Chemical energy is the energy associated with the relative positions of charged particles in matter, okay? Um, so the energy associated with the relative positions of charged 
particles. In uh, actually, I'm going to say atoms and molecules. So, gasoline, the molecules in gasoline have chemical energy, right? Due to the relative positions of the electrons and nuclei in those molecules. And when gasoline undergoes combustion, those particles rearrange to some degree and they end up at a place that has lower chemical energy. And so then that chemical energy can then be released, right, as heat, okay? A um, couple of things here. First of all, uh, energy capacity to work, uh, kinetic energy, energy due to motion, right? Notice that thermal energy, because it's associated with the temperature of an object and because the temperature of an object depends on the motion of the atoms and molecules that compose that object, right? Thermal energy is actually a type of kinetic energy, okay? And notice also that uh, potential energy, which is the energy due to something's position or composition, um, chemical energy, because it's an energy associated with the positions of electrons and nuclei, right? Charged particles is a type of potential energy, right? So some chemical compounds can have very high potential energy and that energy can be released then uh, through a chemical reaction, right? Which is what happens, for example, when iron reacts with oxygen, right? To form iron oxide, all right? These two have higher potential energy than this. The, the positions of the electrons and protons in these molecules, right? And atoms have higher potential energy than they do over here. And that's why energy is given off as heat. Does that make sense? Questions? Um, the law of conservation of energy. You've seen uh, the law of conservation of mass. Right, and it's similar. It's just applied to energy. So in a chemical reaction, energy is neither created nor destroyed, right? And so in a chemical, and in really in, a, in any process, except for nuclear processes, okay, we're, we're, we're excluding nuclear processes here because in nuclear processes, you can have mass converted into energy and energy converted into mass. So we're excluding those for now and just thinking about chemical processes or any physical processes. So even when I, you know, when I take this pen and I drop it, right, it has potential energy, right? When I drop it, that potential energy first becomes what? Kinetic energy. And then when it hits the desk, it becomes thermal energy. But that energy is, ne is neither created nor destroyed, all right? Energy is always transferred around. It's sloshed around. It's dispersed, but it's never destroyed, okay? And then lastly, um, we will be talking about um, energy transfer between a system and its surroundings. Right? And we will always look at these energy transfers from the point of view of the system, right? So if energy goes from the system to the surroundings, right? Then energy is, leaves the system and enters the surrounding, right? You can sort of think of that as money leaving your checking account and entering you know, your friend's checking account if you, if you uh, send your friend some money, right? So what comes, out of, what comes out of the system is negative and what goes into the surroundings is positive. If it goes the other way, right? If your friend gives you money, right? Then it's negative on their side and positive on yours, All right? So it's the same thing for energy, okay? Energy leaving the system carries a negative sign. Energy going into the system carries a positive sign. So an endothermic process carries what kind of a sign, positive or negative? Positive. Positive, right? Endothermic energy comes into the system, right? So that's positive. 
an exothermic process carries what kind of a sign? Negative. 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 Okay. All right. Very good. <clears throat> so, um, so here you have a transfer of energy, right? Uh, so you have a billiard ball that has kinetic energy, right? Why does it have kinetic energy? Because it's moving, right? It has some velocity. And then it collides with another billiard ball. Energy is transferred, right? And then the other billiard ball starts to move and it has the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is transferred from this billiard ball to that billiard ball. So for this billiard ball, the sign of the energy exchange is what? Positive or negative? Energy going out of that billiard ball or into it? Negative. Negative, right? It's going out. It's leaving this billiard ball. And the sign of energy transfer from the point of view of this billiard ball is? Positive. 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 Very good. Um, so if you have a, um, a system, right? It has some internal energy. In fact, let's define that. internal um, the sum of the kinetic the sum of sorry all the kinetic and potential energy of a system okay so internal energy is the sum of all the kinetic and potential energy of a system. So if this is the energy gauge, right? This, this might be the sum of all maybe here, right? And then here are the surroundings. So the system, the system is always the thing you're sort of focused on. Like if you're looking at a chemical reaction, that's your system. Or for example, in the, in the, um, in the chemical cold pack that we talked about, you know, the, the, the ingredients in the cold pack, that would be the system, right? Or in the hand warmer, right? The ingredients of the hand warmer, that would be the system. And then the surroundings are everything that it exchanges energy with, right? So in a process like this, right? The system loses a certain amount of energy and the surroundings gain exactly the same amount as the system lost. Why? Because energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Right? So the surroundings gain the exact amount of energy lost by the system. All right? That's due to the first law. Okay? Does that make sense? Questions? Um, question about, uh, yeah, so the potential, if I hold the pen up here, well, uh, yeah, if I hold the pen up here, it has some potential energy. That potential energy becomes kinetic energy as it begins to fall, and then that kinetic energy becomes thermal energy when it hits the table. So again, it's kind of showing an energy exchange there, kind of like this, same thing, and here, another energy exchange. That's kind of what we're interested in looking at. Uh, Nayeli. Yeah, going back to the energy transfer, would you say that the system is kind of like the medium of what where the energy is like being transferred to and then the surroundings is like the environment yeah the surrounding uh, uh, another good word for the surroundings would be the environment around the system the system is uh the entity that you're focused on like the chemical reaction or i can i could say you know this ball i'm going to define that as my system because i'm focusing on that ball right what's up what does that system do it has kinetic energy then it exchanges that kinetic energy with the surroundings. We could say that this ball now is the surroundings, right? So you can define the system and surroundings however you want, but typically the system is going to be that thing that you're sort of focused on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I was confused on if we look at the system or the surrounding to tell if something's endothermic or exothermic. Great question. Typically, uh, again, you can define, you can change your definition, but typically, yes, you look at the system uh, to define exothermic and endothermic. So 
For chemical reactions, usually the chemical reaction is the system and the surroundings are the environment that it's in. Great, great, great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I have a question about potential energy. Yes. So when you like hold the pencil up, is it gaining potential energy? Yeah, right, exactly. As I, as I move it away from the desk and put it up, right, I'm having to put energy in, which is going into the potential energy of the pen. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Right? So up here, the pen has more potential energy than it did down here. Where did it get that potential energy? From, you know, from my lunch, right? Basically got it from the molecules in my lunch, right? So, so um, it, I, have, I, I, have, I use some energy to pick that pen up, right? And then it has potential energy. When, it, when I drop it, it loses that potential energy and first becomes kinetic energy and then it becomes, transfers it to the desk and then becomes thermal energy. Okay, got it. Yeah, great, great question. One okay. word. Pardon me? The question, the systems and the surroundings. Sorry, I didn't quite get that question. Um, when we, um, for the example that you gave for the pre-lecture, um, I think it was on the video. Yeah. It had given a chemical equation. Yeah. And then um, you defined the reactants as the, I, I believe it was the surrounding and then the Mm. Let, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to summarize that here in just a minute, so hang on and we'll get to that, Diana. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll get to that. So, um, again, units of energy, kilograms, meter squared, second squared is a joule, right? Like we defined earlier. Um, but there's other units that people sometimes use. For, so, for example, um, calories is another unit of energy. A calorie is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So a calorie is the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. All right. And one calorie is equal to 4.18 joules, all right? Um, the nutritional calorie is sometimes, uh, well, it, it, it's always written with a capital C, all right? As opposed to the little c calorie. A nutritional calorie is really just equal to 1,000 little c calories. All right, so when you read the nutritional information on the back of a, a, of a box of Cheerios, right, it's given in big C calories, okay? And that's equal to 1,000 little C calories. Um, you get your energy bill in kilowatt hours because a watt is equal to one joule per second. So a 100 watt light bulb, right, burns 100 joules of energy every second, right? But if you multiply wattage by time, right, you get joules, right? So that's why kilowatt hour, when you take kilowatts and multiply by time, you get a unit of energy, okay? Um, so let's see. Your body uses about uh, 100 calories, big C calories, nutritional calories, to run a mile. Um, your body can easily store about 2,000 calories in glycogen, which means, you know, if you're in good shape, you can run about 20 miles before you use up all your glycogen. And then you have to use other sources of energy, which is not as easily available. And that's why marathon runners, you know, a marathon is 26 miles. When you hit that 20th mile, oftentimes marathoners call that hitting the wall, right? Because you hit the wall because you've burned up all your glycogen. And unless you're eating or taking in some form of energy, then you got to start burning other kinds of energy in your body. And that's a harder process, usually slower to happen. Um, okay, good. Let's see, any more questions?
Okay. Uh, the first law. So the first law um, is the law of conservation of mass, right? Actually, uh, I'll give you the first two laws of thermodynamics. The first law, right, is the laws of thermo laws of thermodynamics. First law is conservation of energy, right? Energy is conserved. Second law is that in all spontaneous processes, in all spontaneous processes, energy is dispersed or spread out, right? We live in a universe where energy is constantly spreading out. It's not concentrating, right? Your cup of coffee gets colder, right? As it transfers energy from the concentrated thermal energy in the coffee to the molecules in the air in the room, right? Energy spreads out. It would be weird, right? If the room got colder and colder as the energy, as the coffee sucked the heat out of the room and the coffee got hotter and hotter, right? That would be a weird universe, right? That's not the way our universe is. In our universe, energy goes the other direction. That's what the second law says, right? The second law says that energy is always gonna go from more concentrated to less concentrated, all right? But it's never gonna be destroyed. It's just gonna be spread out. Uh, the, first, the first law, says that um, you can't have any perpetual motion. Well, the first and the second law together really say that you can't have perpetual motion machines like this. So a perpetual motion machine would be one that would constantly work, right? Constantly move, creating energy uh, without any need for energy input, right? So something like this would be a perpetual motion machine. The idea that, you know, you can just this thing would go around forever. And if you, you know, if you had a little wheel that you could put in this shower of water coming down, right? You could spin that wheel. And by spinning that wheel, you could create electricity. And this would be an eternal source of electricity if this were possible, right? But the first two laws of thermodynamics say that's not possible, right? Because first of all, you can't create energy out of nothing, which is what this thing is doing, right? And even if you were pulling energy out of it, in order for anything to be spontaneous, it has to disperse energy. So this, every process that happens basically has to disperse energy, which means that this can't go on like this forever, right? It'll eventually uh, run out of energy. So one time somebody um, mailed the chemistry department their designs for this perpetual motion car. And this perpetual motion car, and they wanted our opinion on it. Okay, and they had these really nice like blueprints, but basically the car was just a normal car. And the thing that was unique about it is that the tires or the wheels, instead of being round, they were kind of egg shaped, right? So the person's idea was that, well, once you got this car going, right? Just give it over that first hop and then the egg shaped wheels, and it would just keep going forever, right? It'd be kind of a bumpy ride, but you know, the car would just, you know, move on and on. Uh, forever because of these egg-shaped wheels. And you go uphill, downhill, well, no, that, that'll that never happen, right? That violates the laws of thermodynamics, okay? So that can't, that can't occur. So these laws say, unfortunately, uh, we're not gonna solve our energy problems with something that creates energy out of nothing, all right? No perpetual motion. Um, internal energy, which we defined uh, here, right? the sum of all the kinetic and potential energy of a system is something called a state function. A state function. A state function is a quantity that depends only on the state of the system and not on how it got to that state. All right, so um, 
for example, if you're climbing a mountain, your altitude on the mountain is a state function, right? It depends only where you are on the mountain. If you're here, you know, at the top, you might be at 10,000 feet. If you're here, you're at 5,000 feet, right? So your altitude is like a state function. It's analogous to a state function. How long you travel to get to a given altitude is not a state function, right? Because you may go d down this path, which takes you many, many miles to get to here, or you may take this path, which takes you fewer miles, right? So your altitude depends only on where you are. How far you traveled doesn't depend only on where you are, all right? In internal energy, though, is a state function. It depends on only on the state of the system. Now, what that means is that for state functions, you can, you can determine the change in a state function just by taking the final state minus initial state. So delta E, if you want to know the change in internal energy uh, for a system, and E, by the way, did I specify that? I didn't write it down over here. Um, internal energy is symbolized by E, all right? The letter E. So delta E is just equal to the final energy of the system minus the initial energy of the system, right? Just like your altitude on the mountain, it just depends on your final altitude minus your initial altitude. So if you start here at 5,000 feet and you climb to 10,000 feet, right? Your change in altitude is the final altitude, 10,000 feet, minus your initial altitude, which was 5,000 feet, right? So delta altitude would be 5,000 feet, okay? Similarly, energy is a state function, which means that if you want to know the change in energy, it's just the final minus the initial, okay? So if you have a chemical reaction like this, and Diana, I think this might've been your question, um, and you have, uh, the reaction would be here, let's say uh, carbon plus oxygen goes to form CO2, Then if we want to know delta E for this process, right? We can say, okay, what is the energy of the reactants, right? And let's say the energy, the internal energy of the reactants is this. So we'll just plot it here. What is the energy of the products, right? The internal energy of the products. And if the energy, if the internal energy of the reactants is higher than the internal energy of the products, right? Then delta E is negative, right? because final minus initial is gonna be negative, and that's gonna be an exothermic process, right? The reactants have more energy than the product. So as, they, as you go from reactants to, as you go from here to here, energy is gonna be given off, right? You can, uh, you can go the other way too. Uh, if you run this reactant backwards, so for example, from carbon dioxide, and you wanna break it up into carbon and oxygen, what has to happen? You got to put some energy into the system to go from here to there, okay? And the energy flows into the system, delta E in that case is positive. So this would be an exothermic process, yeah? Energy flows out of the system. This would be an endothermic process. Energy flows into the system. This process carries a negative sign, right? Why? Energy is leaving the system. It's like money leaving your checking account, right? That's a negative sign. This carries a positive sign, right? That's like energy going into the system. When money goes into your checking account, that's a positive sign, right? Um, okay, questions? Questions about any of this? Is this making sense? Pretty Can good. you go back to the one that's positive? Does our um, our system change here? Can no, flip? this is still the system. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping the chemical reaction as a, this is the system right here, right? The system is our reaction, right? So in this case, the system goes from higher potential energy to lower potential energy. And then, or sorry, internal energy, higher internal energy to lower internal energy, and energy flows out. In this case, now the reaction is running backwards, right? And in order to get from here to here, energy has to come into the system. 
right? So that's endothermic. Oh, okay, okay. And because internal energy is a state function, right? If delta E this way is exactly equal but opposite in sign for delta E this way, right? Just like, you know, going from here to here is exactly the same change in altitude but opposite in sign is going from here to here. It's the same idea. Okay. Energy is like, is like altitude, it's a state function. Okay, so we're interested in this flow of energy between the system and the surroundings, yeah? That, the energy that is exchanged, we've talked about exothermic reactions, we say that they can be exchanged as heat, so that's one way a system and a surroundings can exchange energy, but it can also be exchanged as work. So for example, when you drive your car, right, the energy in the gasoline turns into work, which causes your car, well, it's turning into work as it causes your car to roll forward, right? So these both kinds of energy exchanges uh, are possible, heat or work, all right? And so we're gonna be um, talking about those here in a minute. Uh, let's see, am I missing anything? Um, okay, good. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Let me just give you some examples and see if you can, um, I'll come back to, oh yeah, let me, let me summarize. This is kind of, this is kind of a summary of what, uh, of everything we've been talking about so far. So, uh, we're going to symbolize heat with the letter Q. All right, so if you have a system, surroundings, right, and they're exchanging energy, they can exchange energy via heat. Like for example, when the chemical cold pack absorbs energy from the uh, athletic injury, right? It's, it's absorbing heat, okay? Um, or when the, uh, the hand warmer undergoes reaction and gives off heat, right? That's an example of heat. But a system of surroundings can also exchange energy uh, via work, all right? So for example, if a chemical reaction occurs inside the piston of an engine, right? Inside the cylinder of an engine and causes the piston to be pushed out, right? That chemical reaction is doing work. It's causing that piston to that cylinder, that piston within that cylinder to expand, right? And it's doing work, which then pushes the car forward, okay? So you have both of these ways to exchange energy, heat and work, right? Heat and work. If energy is going out of the system, right? We say that's negative. If it's going into the system, we say that's positive, okay? And delta E, the change in internal energy, is just equal to Q plus W, right? It's equal to the sum of the heat and the work, all right? All right, so let's look at some examples. Um, if ice melts in a glass of water, and we're defining ice as the system, First of all, is that an example of energy exchange via heat or work? Heat, very good, because heat goes, uh, here's your glass of water, right? Here's your ice, and energy's going this way, right? Heat is going out of the water and into the ice as it melts. The water, what happens to the temperature of the water? decreases, right? Temperature of the water decreases as the ice melts. So what's the sign of Q here? Positive or negative? Negative. Negative. Okay, the ice, the ice is the system. Positive. Positive. Positive, yeah. Right? The ice is the system. So notice energy is going into the ice, right? Out of the water. The water is getting colder, losing thermal energy. The ice is melting and it's gaining thermal energy. Well, it's 
It's actually gaining potential energy, not thermal energy. It's pulling the thermal energy out of the, wa out of the water. The, the energy is being transferred as heat, but it's going into the potential energy of the, of the um, ice particle, ice molecules, water molecules in the ice, sorry. All right, what about uh, sweat evaporating from your skin? First of all, heat or work? Heat. Heat, right? You feel when sweat evaporates, what do you feel? You feel, you get colder. You feel your skin get colder, right? Your skin gets colder because energy is leaving your skin and going into the evaporating water, right? So if the sweat, if the water in the sweat is the system, what's the sign of Q? Negative, negative. So let's see here. Isn't it gaining heat from your skin? Here's you. Okay. Here's the sweat on your arm. Okay. It's evaporating, right? Is energy going away from you to the, to the water molecules or from the water molecules to you? Away from you. Away from, away from you, right? Energy Q is going away from you, right? Away from you and into the sweat. If the sweat is the system, what's the sign of Q? Negative. It's positive. Positive, right? It's positive. The sweat is the system. The sweat is absorbing energy from your skin. That's why your skin feels cold, right? Energy is being taken away from you and into the sweat. Uh, Emily, question. So in an example like that, how do you know, so it, we're given that sweat is the, is the system. Yes. How do you know what the surroundings is? Like, would it be skin or the right. air? The, the, the surroundings is everything else but the system. Oh. So in this case, the, the majority of the surroundings is the skin because that's where most of the energy is coming from. Okay. Got it. Good question. Uh, Emily. Oh, that was you. All right. You asked your question. Was there another question? Okay. Awesome. Gas burns in an automobile cylinder. The gasoline is the system. Is that an example of heat or work? Did you say both? Both. It's both, right? It's both. It gives off heat. And it does work, right? Put your put your hand on the on the engine, and you can feel the heat, right? As the engine as it gives off heat, the car can move forward, which means that it's also doing work. All right. So in that case, uh, here is your car, right? Here is your gasoline, right? And um, this is the forward direction, and. Um, it's burning in the engine, so it's doing heat. So it's doing, so the system is giving off heat and it's doing work. And in both cases, what's the sign of Q and W when we define the gasoline as the system? Negative. We say negative. They're both negative, right? Heat is being given off. The system is losing energy due to heat and the system is losing energy due to work, okay? And the total change in internal energy is the sum of both of those. So if they're both negative, then delta E is also negative, yeah? All right, very good. Just a quick question. Do they both go hand in hand usually? Uh, like no, they don't have to go in the same direction. Okay, okay. All right, so now we want to try to quantify both of these things. So our picture is this. We have a system. We have the surroundings. They're exchanging energy. They're exchanging energy via heat and via work. And now we want to quantify it, right? We want to figure out how much heat is being given off, how much work is being done, OK? So uh, the first thing we're going to look at is quantifying heat. All right, how do we quantify heat? So I know you saw a video on this already, right? So if a system is absorbing heat, right, it's gonna undergo a change in temperature, 
okay? And those are gonna be proportional. Q proportional to delta T, all right? And the constant of proportionality is called the heat capacity. So the heat capacity depends on two things, the quantity of the substance and the type of substance, all right? So you can think of heat capacity, and let me, um, let me see, um, so let's define it, heat capacity. Heat capacity C. So we'll define it as the quantity of heat of heat to change temperature by one degree Celsius. All right. Now, usually, because it depends both on the type of substance and on the amount of substance, we also wanted to find something called the specific heat capacity. So the quantity of heat to change temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius, right? Uh, let me illustrate the difference between these two. Let's say you have a small iron pan and a large iron pan, right? The small iron pan has a lower heat capacity than the large iron pan. Why? Because it's smaller, there's less mass, right? But the iron that makes up the pans has the same specific heat capacity in both cases because it's per gram, okay? Um, so the equation for specific heat capacity is Q is equal to MC delta T. So Q is heat, M is mass, C is Specific heat capacity, I should put a little S down there. Specific heat capacity. And delta T is the change in temperature. And remember, whenever you see a delta, it's always final minus, minus initial. Okay, so delta T is equal to T final minus T initial. All right. And that's our equation for, um, for heat capacity. Okay, and here are the specific heat capacity of some common substances, right? So you can see water right here is 4.18. So water has a very, very high heat capacity compared to other substances, right? Um, it, takes 40, it takes 40 times more, almost 40 times more heat to change the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius than it does to change the temperature of one gram of lead by one degree Celsius, all right? Water is more resistant to temperature change, okay? That's why, um, for example, right, let's say, um, so let's say here's, Calif here's California, something like that, right? Here's um, Santa Barbara, right? Uh, and, and, you know, right here, is Bakersfield, right? So on a, on, a, on a hot August day, right? Santa Barbara might be 85 degrees Celsius and Bakersfield is gonna be 115 degrees Celsius. Fahrenheit. Ah, th thank you. <laughs> Fahrenheit, good point. Uh, you're right. Um, why is there such a big temperature difference between Santa Barbara and Bakersfield when in fact, they both are about the same latitude and they both get about the same energy from the sun? The difference is that in Bakersfield, that energy is falling onto 
sand and dirt and rocks and things like that, right? Which have a lower heat capacity than here in Santa Barbara where a lot of that energy is falling onto what? The ocean, right? And the ocean has a, a much higher heat capacity than sand and rocks and things like that, right? So this part is gonna be more resistant to temperature change than this part. This is gonna, this is gonna fluctuate more, the temperature is going to go up more, even though the same amount of heat is falling on both things. Does that make sense? Questions? All right, let's do a quick poll here and have you answer this question, see if you're following along. Did I lose some of you? I just popped up a question. If you if you uh, if you're still out there, please uh, try to answer it. Okay. Five more seconds. All right, good. Um, so most of you, a lot of you got it right, but not everybody. So you can see uh, the right answer is A, lead, okay. Um, some of you put silver and copper and some put none, but um, so what's going on here? So remember, you can sort of think of heat capacity as a measure of the resistance to change temperature given a certain amount of heat applied, right? The higher the heat capacity, the more resistant the thing is to change temperature, right? So water has a very, very high heat capacity, which is why Santa Barbara doesn't get as hot during the day, right, as Bakersfield, yeah? Um, so things with low heat capacity will undergo big changes in temperature, right? For a given amount of heat. Things with high heat capacity, because if you think about it, if you look at delta T, let's come back to this equation for a minute. Um, right, if, if you look at delta T is equal to Q over C, right? For a given amount of heat, if C is very big, right, then delta T is very small. If heat capacity is small, then delta T is very big, right? So which one's going to have the largest increase in temperature, the one with the smallest heat capacity, right? And that's lead, all right? Does that make sense? Questions? All right, let's go ahead and do an actual calculation now using this equation. Okay, what is the heat? So we're gonna, so we're already gotta find Q associated with warming 5.00 grams of aluminum, right? from T1 equals negative 15 degrees Celsius to T2 equals 35.0 degrees Celsius. 
all right? Um, and then they give you the specific heat. Um, Cs is equal to 0 0.903 joules per gram degree Celsius, okay? <laughs> and we gotta find Q, all right? So this is just a matter of plugging in uh, to that equation Q is equal to MC delta T, right? So we're gonna say Q is equal to MC delta T. So we have 5.00 grams of aluminum times 0 0.903 joules per gram degree Celsius, right? Times delta T, which is always T final minus T initial, 35.0 degrees Celsius minus negative 15.0 degrees Celsius. Be careful with signs there when you're dealing with degrees Celsius, right? Because this, of course, together is going to be 50.0 degrees Celsius, right? Because a minus minus becomes a plus, okay? So you multiply that all together and you get plus 226 joules. So notice it's positive. Does that make sense? Always ask yourself, does, it make, does the sign make sense? The temperature went up, right? So what must have been happening? Was energy going in or out? Going in. Going in, right? Because it got warmer, right? So the energy was going in, and that makes sense that it's positive, right? Okay, I'll give one here for you to try. Go ahead and try this one yourself. Professor, on the heat capacity, yeah. should it be Celsius? Uh, okay, good, good, great question. Because the size of the degree Celsius and the degree Kelvin are the same, it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Because right, when you do the change in temperature, it doesn't matter. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so they're interchangeable. They're interchangeable in this case. Okay, in this case. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, about five more seconds. Okay, so correct answer was 
D, yeah, most of you got that, very, very good. A few of you missed it by a little bit. So really, really quickly, uh, what do you wanna do? Um, you are given that the mass is 3.54 grams, right? You got that it's heated to 96.2 and then allowed to cool, right? So T1 is equal to 96.2 degrees Celsius. T2 is equal to 22.5 degrees Celsius, right? And you want to find Q in that case, right? And you're given the specific heat, right? So what do you do? You're going to plug in again and the Q is equal to MC delta T. So you got 3.54 grams times 0 0.903 joules per gram degree Celsius, right? Times, this is where you got to be a little bit careful. What's T2? T2 is the final temperature, right? So that's 22.5 degrees Celsius minus the initial temperature, 96.2 degrees Celsius. All right, so notice this is negative 73.7 degrees Celsius, okay? So uh, if you multiply all that out, you get negative 236 joules. Now, why is it negative? What's happening? You're having something that's very hot and it's getting colder, right? So the thing is losing energy to the surroundings, right? So energy is going out. Energy going out carries what sign? Negative. Jane. I'm confused why you put Celsius underneath when the question to the specific heat was joules per oh. gram. Yeah, sorry. You know what? I should change that to I should just change that to to, to Celsius. Uh, for this, it doesn't matter because the sign of the degree is the size of the degree is the same. So if you did Kelvin or Celsius, if, if you converted this to Kelvin, you'd still get negative seventy three point seven Kelvin. So nothing would change. Sorry, I, I I overlooked that. I should have I should either change this to to Celsius or change this to Kelvin. But it, it it's it's of no it, it makes no difference. Okay. Skylar? How come in this example you use the specific heat of aluminum, but in the last example, the specific heat didn't come into play at all? Uh, yeah, it did. Right here. Oh, okay. Never mind. I'm sorry. I yeah. Yeah, yeah. Same thing in both of them. Any other questions? This makes sense? So um, will always be that the uh, like the, here is uh, a 3.54 grams piece of aluminium is heated to 96.2 uh, Celsius degree. That will be always um, the the amount being reduced or how it works. The 22.5 minus 96.2. So it's not following that. It's always the final temperature minus the initial temperature. Oh, okay, okay, yes. Right, it's Thank you. Final, it's always, so delta T is always going to be T2 minus T1 or T final minus T initial. All right. Oh, all right. Thank you. And if you do it that way, you always get the sign correct. I think okay, it's just worded you. kind of funny. That's why you can get it confused. Say that again? Like it's worded like a little fun, like when I read it, I kind of did the same mistake of kind right. of like switching them. Right, like right. You, you have to like be it's careful about it. Right. Got it. But what you're looking at is, what is the heat associated with the cooling process, right? From going from this temperature to that temperature. But you're right. Uh, if you read it incorrectly, you could think, oh, okay, what's the temperature associated with heating it, right? But it's asking for cooling. Yeah. Good. Uh, other questions? Okay, very good. Um, in, in your problem set, you have to do a problem in which you are working with energy transfer, okay? Thermal energy transfer from one thing to another. So for example, suppose you put a hot piece of metal into water, right? What happens? The metal cools and the water warms, right? So the metal's losing energy 
and the water is gaining energy, right? But according to first, according to the first law of thermodynamics, the amount of energy lost by the metal has to exactly equal the amount gained by the water, right? So we can write Q metal is equal to minus Q water. Now, notice that this minus sign doesn't matter what side I put it on. All this is saying is that the two are equal in magnitude but opposite in sign, right? It's because I can easily just write minus Q metal is equal to Q water, right? It doesn't matter what side I put the negative sign in on. All this equation is saying is that these are equal in magnitude, right? But opposite in sign. Okay, it doesn't matter what side you put uh, the negative on. So if you have to work a problem like this, then you know that for the metal, uh, the metal cools down, we know that the amount of heat being given off is equal to M metal, the mass of the metal, times the heat capacity of the metal, times delta T for the metal, right? And that's equal to minus, and again, it doesn't matter which side you put the minus sign on, the mass of the water times the heat capacity of the water times delta T for the water, okay? So when, you're, when you have a thermal energy transfer problem like this one, right, where you have two things changing temperature, right? The metal's losing energy to the water, the metal's cooling down, the water's heating up, right? All you gotta do is say, okay, these two are gonna be equal to each other in magnitude, but opposite in sign, right? So you just set them equal to each other, and then you write the equation for the Q metal on one side, for the Q water on the other, plug in all the things you know, and then solve for the thing you don't know. All right, so in, in problems like this, it's gonna give you all of these quantities except for one, right? And you gotta find for the one that you're given, okay? And remember that delta T is always gonna be T final minus T initial in both cases, right? Uh, in this case, it's gonna be for the metal. In this case, it's gonna be for the water, okay? Uh, the other important thing to realize is that T final for the metal is gonna be equal to T final for the water. Why is that? Because this will keep giving off its heat, right, until what happens? Until they both reach the same temperature, right? Once they reach the same temperature, then energy transfer will stop, right? So the final temperature of both of the, both the metal and the water are the same, okay? So um, anyway, I'm not gonna work a problem like this in class, but you will have a problem like this to work uh, on your problem set. Laurel. So technically the term cold is just a misnomer. There's really no such thing as cold. It's just the absence of heat, right? Correct, yeah, very, very good. Um, so cold is really a relative term until you get to zero Kelvin. That's cold. That's as cold as you, that's absolutely cold. You can't get any colder than zero Kelvin or negative 273.15 Celsius, right? Because that's the point where molecular motion basically stops, okay? But you're absolutely right. Cold and hot are relative terms until you get to absolute zero. All right, uh, what else? Any other questions? Okay, so we're, we're getting very close here. Um, we have our system and our surroundings, right? We said they can exchange energy via heat. So the system can give off heat to the surroundings. The surroundings can give off heat to the system. We know how to quantify heat. Q is equal to MC delta T, right? But they can also exchange energy via work, all right? So we've quantified this one. Now we want to quantify work. And the equation for work is given by um, this. Work is equal to minus P delta V, all right? Um, and let me give you a quick example of that. Uh, work is what happens in the cylinder 
of, a, of an automobile when gasoline is burned, right? So the gasoline is burned, it expands. As it expands, it pushes on this cylinder, right? So we can think about it then as, um, here's the cylinder in, in the initial state, it expands, right? It's gonna undergo a change in height, which really becomes a change in volume, all right? And um, in this equation, W is equal to the work done. P is equal to the external pressure. In other words, the pressure that this thing is pushing against, okay? And delta V is the change in volume, V2 minus V1, okay? So, I'll just do this example real quick and then, uh, well, maybe I'll save this for next time. Uh, I think I'll save this for next time because I don't have enough time for me to do the example and uh, do the question. So uh, at the beginning of next time, just remember where we are, right? We're talking about system surroundings. They're exchanging energy. They can exchange energy via heat. We've already looked at the equation for heat, right? They can exchange energy for work. Next time, we'll do an example of how to calculate the amount of energy exchange due to work. All right, and then of course, delta E is always equal to what? The sum, the sum of the heat plus the work. All right, very good. Uh, any last minute questions? I'll, I'll stick around of course for further questions after class is over, but are there any uh, last minute questions on anything we went over today? Megan. So just to quickly confirm, because it kind of messed with my head a little bit. So yeah. energy that's um, going into a surrounding from a system that's going to be a positive or heat, sorry. So, so if it's going from the system to the surroundings, it's going out of the system, right? So we always keep track of it from the point of view of the system. If energy is leaving the system, if money is leaving your checking account, what's the sign? Negative. Negative. Okay, negative. If it's leaving the system, it's negative. So exothermic is negative, right? Heat coming into the system is positive. Okay. So right? like the spin example that you gave with the sweating, because, oh, oh, okay. It's, it's <laughs> Awesome. Good, good, good. Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and officially end class there. Um, thank you everyone, have a great day. Uh, a couple of reminders, we have class again on Wednesday, of course, and also watch out for that um, instructor evaluation that you should be getting an email about. Please, um, please take some time to fill that out. Uh, it would mean a lot to me. I appreciate uh, your honest evaluation and um, I'll see you all on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, guys.